Turn with me to Luke chapter 12. Um, we're going to begin today a new series or a series that we're just calling The Culture of the Kingdom. And, and we'll talk on that a little bit more as we go through this. But really, in order for there to be a, a, a revolution, somebody has to get tired of the old and say, I want something new. Now, now I, I've said this. I, I'm not trying to be critical of any particular age, any particular um, uh, church age. I'm not saying, oh, we're going to do it better than... That's not the point I'm trying to make. What I'm trying to say is, is in, in the church realm, we have come to a place of complacency because we've been accepted, and I'm saying it's time for us to break out and revolt against the norm because God's looking for a church that's ready to be used of him and by him for his purposes. And so it's going to take us understanding the culture of the kingdom. And so it says this, in Luke chapter 12, verse 29, don't keep striving for what you should eat and what you should drink, and don't be anxious, for the Gentile world eagerly seeks all these things, and your Father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom. And these things will be provided for you. Don't be afraid, little flock, because your father delights to give you the kingdom. Don't be afraid, little flock, because your father delights to give you, say, give me, give me. the kingdom. Verse 33, sell your possessions and give to the poor. Make money bags for yourselves that won't grow old and, and inexhaustible treasure, uh, won't grow old and inexhaustible treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So today I want to begin the culture of the kingdom with a sermon I've just entitled Motive of the Kingdom. Father, I pray that in these moments, that your Holy Spirit would teach us. Father, I just thank you that your word says that your word would not return void unto you, but it would accomplish what you desire, or what you desire for it to accomplish in us. And so this morning, allow your word, perform your word in us, and we give you thanks, and we give you praise. And everybody that believed it said, Amen. Amen. So in John chapter 18, Jesus is before Pilate. It's after he's been, uh, after he's been denied or been turned in by Judas. And, and he's sitting before Pilate. And Pilate is trying to find a way to let him go. And Pilate be asking, or asking them questions. He asked this question, are you, are you a king? And in verse 36, um, John, John uh, records it this way. In John chapter 18, verse 36, he records it like this. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. Now that's important because Pilate asked him, are you a king? And in that whole dissertation of those things that he says, he says, well, if, if you've said it, then well, you know, what are you asking me for? If you've already made that a, a claim and, and that kind of going back and forth a little bit, but he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I would not be delivered to the Jews, but now my kingdom is not from here. So let me ask you a quick question and, and uh, I ask this, um, how many know Jesus Christ is your personal savior? Now, can I tell you something? If you know Christ, do you realize that you live in a kingdom, but you don't belong to this kingdom? Because if you're in Christ, you belong to his kingdom, a greater kingdom. In fact, what Jesus is saying, and as we begin to talk about the culture of the kingdom, what Jesus is saying, he says, if it was, the, if it was in my culture for my, for my kingdom to rise up and to fight, that's what they would do. But that's not their culture. And so this morning as we begin to look at the culture of the kingdom, we have to recognize some things. That to receive the kingdom, to receive the kingdom, you need to receive the king. That's, that, that's pretty basic for us, correct? To receive the kingdom, you have to receive the king. So we have to receive Christ. So all of you said this morning, I, I, I know Christ. Then if you know Christ, then you're in his kingdom. However, for you to receive the, out, the overflow of the kingdom, it takes more than just knowing Christ. 
That's the prerequisite. That's the front door. That's the key into it. But you realize that we have to learn the culture of the kingdom. Let, let me parallel it like this. Our sons and daughters, they grow up. And in order for them to go to the next level, they go to kindergarten, and hopefully they pass kindergarten, and uh, we pray, that we, we intercede to them fast and pray that they'll, fa- they'll pass kindergarten. But the point is they pass kindergarten. Of course, Ryan didn't the first time he went. Uh, we kept him out. No, <laughs> that's, that's not true. We, we didn't make him go all the way through. We said, you're too smart for them. Stay, stay home. Uh, but the point is, is, is to go to first grade, they have to, there's prerequisites, the things they have to write. And then they go to second grade, and each, each level they keep moving up. They get, to, they get to about 14 or 15 years old, and they begin to take their driver's test. And the law says you can't legally drive. <laughs> now, you can drive, but you can't legally drive until you're 16, pass the test, and go all right. There are prerequisites of being able to have that driver's license. They give you the driver's license that says, now you have the license. Can I tell you something? Coming to Christ makes us a part of the kingdom. Us being able to operate freely in all that the kingdom has for us, we need to understand the culture. And there's things that we, we walk through and other things that we must, in a sense, gain in our lives. And so this morning, as we begin to talk about the culture of the kingdom, to receive the kingdom, we must live within the culture of the kingdom. Bishop, Bishop Tudor, and we've, we've kind of already hit this a little bit, but Bishop Tudor Bismarck teaches, when we respond to a spiritual influence, that it begins to create an atmosphere. So this morning, as, as the worship team began to lead us, and we began to respond to that, we begin to spot, respond in our worship, we begin to respond in praise. You, do you realize that we began to create an atmosphere of worship? We began to create an atmosphere of praise. And as we begin to create that, what happens then, and as that's sustained in our lives, that atmosphere of, of, uh, then begins to create a climate. Have you ever been around someone that it seems like every time you're around them, there's one of two things. Either whenever you're around them, they're always gloom and doom, woe is me. Or you're around those people, the man, you're just like, man, what drug are you on this morning? <laughs> right? Good drug, <laughs> not bad drug, good drug. Now, now, I don't know about you, that person that has the good stuff, that's the people that we kind of like hanging out with more than the person, because it seems like the person's always, oh, I'm barely going to make it. It's like, man, you, when you see them, you run, right? Because it's like, man, they just sap all the energy out of you. It's like, it's like, stay away. And why? Because those individuals have created an atmosphere and a climate around their life. And they've stayed in it so long that it begins to become sustained in them. And not only does it become a climate in them. In fact, a bishop goes on to teach, if you sustain that climate, it becomes a stronghold. And a lot of times when we use the word stronghold and we think it's a bad thing because the enemy creates a stronghold against us. But you know something? The Bible says the name of the Lord is a strong tower. He's a stronghold. The righteous run into it and they are saved. So when we begin to create an atmosphere for his presence to come and dwell, and if we'll sustain that, that becomes a climate in our lives. And that climate begins to develop as we sustain that a stronghold. So that whatever we may face, there may be difficulties that we face, we run into that stronghold. And that stronghold keeps us and protects us. Even when all those things happen, even when those people come around, oh, I'm so bad. It's that, that climate and that stronghold you have, it rises you and raises you up above that. And you say, you know something, buddy? I love you and I appreciate you, but God has a solution. He has an answer. And it looks bad today, but man, greater is he. Amen. Come on. And so... Bishop goes in and continues to teach as we create that atmosphere and sustain it. It creates a climate that we live in, and that climate begins to uh, build and develop and grow. And as that's sustained, it creates a stronghold. And that stronghold, when it is sustained, creates a culture. It's a culture. Think about it just real quickly. Think of the disciples when they first come to Jesus. And think of the disciples after the day of Pentecost. They got around Jesus. And even though they've been around Jesus for those three and a half years, we realize it wasn't, Peter was still big mouth Peter, right? 
all the way up until after things changed. And he began to understand the culture of the kingdom. And so this morning, as we look at this, uh, let me talk about culture. The predom- it's defined like this, the predominating attitudes and behavior that characterizes the functioning of a group or organization. Um, these patterns, traits, and, and products considered as the expression of a particular period, class, community, or population, um, or it's an example, acceptable standard of what's normal. The sad thing is, is the church has accepted the norm of the culture that we live in and God is calling us to a revolution that says no longer is the norm of this kingdom good enough. We want the norm of the kingdom of God. The culture of of His kingdom. So it's how how our culture is created. It's sustained by obedience. Our obedience as a believer. In that that culture, we have the authority of Christ. It's the pulling down of the negative strongholds that changes culture. It creates a transforming power. It's created by a transforming power. And that power is Christ. So its characteristics are shapes, beliefs, assumptions, values, customs, and it perpetuates strongholds, both positive and negative. We kind of touched on that a little bit, but um, Dr. Sam Chan, in a book, in a little booklet that he wrote, Change Your Culture, Change Everything, he says this, he writes this, culture, not a vision or strategy, is the most powerful factor in any organization. In other words, when we start, talk, when we start talking about our vision statement, that the, the Destiny Center is a New Testament church impacting our community, that means, uh, that means nothing to you unless it means something within your culture and has value in your culture. We can go to the local elementary school, middle school, high school, university. We can go to your workplace and we can stand in the corner and say, the Destiny Center is a New Testament church impacting our community. And they're going to look at you and go, so what? Because it's not a part of their culture and it doesn't impact their culture. That's why we need you to be impacted so that when you go into that place, the culture that you're carrying in there impacts the culture. In other words, let, let me say it like this, and I've said it many times in this idea. Listen, we're not thermostats. We're, we, or we're not the thermometer. We're the thermostat. We set the level. Listen, if we're not setting the level in our workplaces, then we need to ask God to come and give us a spiritual revolution. We need to raise the standard of righteousness. We need to raise the standard of ethics. They shouldn't be looking to somebody else to set it. We ought to set it. Because we're followers of Christ. That's in our culture. That's who we are in Christ. And so as we, as we walk through these things over the next several weeks, talking about the culture of the kingdom, let me give you some fundamental kingdom, uh, fundamentals of the kingdom first. Number one, this, the foundation of the kingdom. The foundation of the kingdom says this, um, Jesus, in replying to, to um, the, the disciples, especially to Peter in Matthew 16 and verse 17, he says, Simon, son of Barjona, you are blessed because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I say to you that Peter, uh, that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. So the foundation of the kingdom is Christ. The foundation of the kingdom of God is Christ. The second thing we see, the authority of the kingdom Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18, uh, as he came near to his disciples and he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All authority. Now, let's, let's go back a little bit. In Genesis, we see that God gave Adam authority. And yet he gave it up. Why did he give it up? Because he sinned. He was disobedient. And in his disobedience, Satan took that authority away from him. But thanks be to God, Jesus came and he took that away from the enemy and Jesus has given the authority, his authority to the church. So the authority of the kingdom is in Christ as well. Then as we begin to talk about authority, I think we can talk about 
Uh, another um, fundamental is the power of the kingdom. Jesus says in Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So why, you would say, well, why do we need, a th- why do we need power? Because in order to, uh, for us, the church, us as believers, to accomplish the assignment that he's placed on us as the church, as the destiny center, we need his power to operate in us and through us. It's not because we have the best programs. It's not because we have the biggest buildings. It's not because of any of those things. It comes down to this, his power. In fact, the the prophet Zechariah says, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So the power of the kingdom comes through Christ by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit upon us. In fact, we recognize that when when we receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit, as we identify it, that Jesus is the baptizer. Why do we say that? Because John said, I baptize you with water, but there's going to come one after me. I'm not even unworthy to untie his shoes, but he'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. (laughs) Holy Spirit and with fire. That's the power of the kingdom. And you and I need the power. We don't need, to, don't need to just be able to say, well, I know Jesus. That, that, that's super important because that gets me into the kingdom. But I need to now operate in the power of the kingdom. And that's when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. So as we think of the kingdom for just a moment, and, and we don't think of this a lot in, in, our, in our settings because we have a president and we vote them in and out if we like them or don't like them. And we do all this stuff and, and ran, ran, ran. And, and, and I, I love democracy. It's awesome. It's those things. But when we begin to think of a king, we don't want anybody telling us what to do. And when there's a kingdom, there's a king. So when we begin talking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, we have to realize there's a king, and if there's a king, then that means there's subjects, and you and I are the subjects to the king, and so we're obedient, and we follow the king. But here's the awesome thing about about all of this this morning. When we begin talking about the kingdom, God made a way for us to be in his kingdom. Do you get that? God made a way. I just want you to know something. I don't care how big your pocketbook is. I don't, how many, I don't care how many degrees you have on the wall. I don't care what your last name is. I don't care how many times you've gone to church. Can I tell you something? There's not one thing that you or I have done to gain God's favor to let me be a part of the kingdom. And yet God made a way for us to be a part of the kingdom. It says this, for God so loved the world. So what motivated God? It wasn't our goodness. It wasn't even our need. It was his love. For God so loved the world that he gave. I love what it says in Romans 5.8. Probably, that, I would say Romans 5.8 is one of, my, one of my life scriptures that God demonstrated his love toward us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died. How awesome is that? That God made a way for you and I to be in his kingdom. But you know something? To be in his kingdom is one thing. But to enjoy all the benefits of the kingdom, I have to understand what the culture of that kingdom is. So when I, come, when I come to worship him, I don't come to worship him and say, well, here I am, God. Show up. Do your thing. Help me. I'll tell you a story, and if you've been here for two or three days, you may have heard this story, but I, I, it, it really resonated with me. Um, I, was in youth, I was a youth pastor. We were youth pastoring in Chickasha. I brought a, I brought a group of students to come to, to Southwestern. They were coming for campus days. And uh, we'd driven four, four and a half hours, five hours, what it was to get there. I get there, and they, in that evening, they do a, a campus live or whatever it is, and they do worship and all that stuff. And, and I remember going in, and, and I get the kids registered. They're all in. They're all taken care of. And I come, come in kind of the back of the auditorium, and I sit down, and they stand up to worship. And I sit down. And, and the, the conversation was a little bit like this. It, I wasn't talking to myself, but there was that inner voice. And they're worshiping, and it's like, stand up. I'm tired. I'm driven. I don't, I don't want to stand up. And, and, and wouldn't you know, the things that I would say always come back to haunt you, right? And it's like, 
if you were in youth service, would you let your kids sit down? I'm like, hush. They didn't drive four and a half hours. I did. And then this thought. Who do you think that you are that you can come in and out however you want to into my presence? See, because when the king reigns, you live your life like the way the way the king says live your life. And God made a way for us to be a part of his kingdom. But in enjoy, enjoy all of the benefits of the kingdom. Yes, I have to first know Christ. But I have to do according to the culture of his kingdom. To understand and to, and to enjoy all the benefits. So God's motive for, us, for him to make a way for us is love. You know, there are many motivators in our life, right? Have you ever been motivated by fear? You're going somewhere. Dog starts chasing you. You're motivated by fear to run faster than that dog. It's a great motivator. Can I tell you something in my, in my life? I've been motivated by this black strap that was about like this. And on the end, it had a little metal buckle. And it had two prongs where the, for the hole. And I, I can, even to this day at times, I can hear that coming down the hallway. I was motivated as a young boy, <laughs> as a young man, to be obedient to mom and dad. Not because I feared them, but I was I didn't care for the punishment side of it, right? Sometimes, sometimes we can be motivated um, by money. If you, I'll give you X dollars if you'll do this. Oh, that's not enough. Okay, I'll double it. Okay, I'll do it. We're motivated by money. And that's not, that's not a bad motivator in some ways other than this. Um, the Word of God says that the love of money is the root of all evil. It didn't say money is the root. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. And so money can be a, a, contrib- a contributing factor. Revenge may be a motivator. Maybe it's a desire for power may be a motivator. I, I don't know what it is that motivates you. For some people, it's, it's a hug motivates people. And some people, it's a, oh, that's attaboy. Way to go. Way to go, Stephen. And Stephen, I'll do it again. Uh, and those things are not, those, there's nothing wrong with that. But here's the thing about fear. Fear ultimately turns to rebellion. Can I tell you something? If I only, I only followed my mom and dad's uh, uh, direction because of, I was afraid of that belt, you know there's going to be a day that I was away from that belt. And when I'm away from that belt, then, then what gonna, what's going to motivate me to do what's right? If it's fear, it won't. I didn't have to pay my kids money because they were good for nothing. And <laughs> right? If it's if because it's I because I, I desire power, what 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 motivates? And what's something that's lasting? Can I tell you what it is? It's what motivated God in His love. Love is the motivation. Of the kingdom. Love is the motivation of the kingdom. For God so loved that he gave. They would ask Jesus, what's the greatest, what, what's the greatest command? And in verse Matthew 22, verse 37, he says this, Love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important commandment. And the second is like it as he continues, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. Love becomes the motivation of why why do we live for God? Why do we get up and go to church? Why do we do we do? do the things that we do why why do we go to work and we live ethically why because we love God and because I love God I desire to do what he calls us to do that's the culture of the kingdom can I tell you something today you want to know why I did what I did as I grew up and I moved out of my mom and daddy's house one I loved them but secondly I and most importantly I loved God 
I don't, I don't want to toot my own horn. I'm just trying to make a point here. My parents I never called me and said, did you go to church this morning? When I was in college, and even now that I'm grown up, <laughs> the reason they showed up today is just to make sure I was in church today. No, but they didn't call me and say, did you go to church today? No, you don't know what? Because I loved God. And I love to be in the present, in his presence and around the presence of his people. And what motivated me was not because, oh, oh, all these good things. No, because I loved God and I still love God. And that's why I'm motivated today to do what he's called me to do. Not because it's easy, not because it's, not because it's always comfortable, not because everybody's like, oh, that's great, because I love him. Why did Jesus go to the cross? For two reasons. Because he loved his father. And it says for the joy that was set before him. The love that he had for you and I. That's what motivated him to go to the cross. Not because, well, I got to do this. God won't take it away from me. I guess I'll do it. It says for the joy that was set before him. He endured it. Come on, church. We've got to get the culture of the kingdom in us because the culture of the world's in us because we live in it all the time. But the culture of the kingdom has to overcome it. And when it overcomes it, then all the, all the resources of the kingdom become our, come to our disposal. Because I know Christ and because I know this, he desires. It's the Father's good pleasure to give me and to give you the kingdom. But the motivation factor is love. The motivation of the kingdom is love. Why, why, do, we, why do we send money to missionaries? Not just so that we can check it off and hopefully God will love us more. We send it because we love God and we have a love for other people. And we have a love for those people that are lost. And so we do it, and we don't do it out of obligation. We do it as, out of recognizing God has blessed me to be a blessing. And so in the culture of the kingdom, our first motivation and greatest motivation has to be love. In fact, Paul would write in 1 Corinthians, he's, he's talking about all the gifts the gift of healing, gift of faith, the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, all those things. And he says, I can do all of these things, but I have not love, then I am nothing. I can give my body, I can let them burn it, I can do what, but if I don't have love, then it means absolutely nothing. And I'm telling you something today, unless we begin to get the love of God on the inside of us, what we uh, try to accomplish will be nothing unless it's motivated by a love for God and a love for others. That's the motivating factor. So let me illustrate it like this. Many of you may have seen the movie um, End of the Spear. It's about, it's about five missionaries in 1956 that went to bring Christ to a tribe that had never been reached. In fact, one of the reasons they had never been reached because they were recognized as being very violent. And they, in weeks and months before they would go, Jim Elliott and his crew would go, and they, they would fly, fly by in a plane, and they would drop out gifts. They'd drop things out, trying to create some relationship connection. And about January the 2nd of 1956, they, they moved not far from the tribe, and they, they created a camp, and... Um, and and they wanted to be close enough but far enough away. But at the same time, they began to make uh, gestures back toward. On January the 8th, though, they decided they were going to have an op make, take the opportunity to go and introduce themselves and begin to create a relationship so they could bring this tribe the gospel. If you've seen the movie or heard the story, um, on January the 8th, those five missionaries gave their lives. Those people that they were trying to help come to Christ came in to kill them. And many times when that happens in our lives, we're like, wait a minute, I did all these things for God, and yet look what happened. Why did he do this? <laughs> but you know something, the question isn't why. The question is this, what motivated them? Love for God 
and a love for others. That's the culture of the kingdom. That's the motivating fact. They knew that in going, there was a possibility of dying. They knew that was, potentially could happen. There was a lot of things they potentially could have done even to protect themselves even greater than what they did. But here's the thing. They went because they, they sensed and believed that God was calling them to reach this people group. And the way that they needed to reach this people group, they had to go in unarmed. And so here it is, January the 8th. And they give their lives to this tribe that kills them with spears and machetes. And they were motivated to go out of love. Kind of dire consequences, kind of tough, tough reaction, trying to show somebody love. Maybe you've done that in your own life. You tried to love somebody and feel rejected or, or beaten down. And maybe you didn't, obviously you didn't give your life for that. But think of it for just a moment. They were motivated by love. Here's the awesome thing about January the 8th is not the end of the story. January the 8th is not the end of this story. No, they didn't come back to life. No, nothing spectacular like that happened. But several years later, Jim Elliott's wife and one of the other, and one of the other um, in men's sister go back to that tribe and leads them to Christ. See? Because when the motivation is love, and it's not fear or accolade or any of the other things, when the motivation is love, you'll even go back into the, in, into the middle of the potential dangerous situation. Why? For the love of God. Love is an outstanding motivator. One of the things that, that um, John writes in First John, he says that perfect love casts out all fear, but it talks about this. In that type of love, we are made perfect or we are made complete. So in the culture of the kingdom, the motivation of the kingdom is love. And we read this story of Elizabeth Elliot and Rachel Saint who would go back as missionaries to this same tribe and they would have the opportunity to lead that tribe, lead those individuals to Christ. In fact, um, if you go online, you, you can do this. You can go online and there's pictures of Nate Saint's son, Nate saint son i believe that's right his son the man one of the men that killed his dad he would then call him later call him grandpa why because the motivating factor of the kingdom is love And if we're going to allow the culture of the kingdom not only to change us, but to change the culture we're in, we have to walk in the love of God. John, won't you come? How, how do we do that? Well, first of, all, the, the, first of all, you have to know Christ. There's no other way to know the love of God without knowing Christ. You can't, you can't just sit around Christians and say, okay, I'm going to get this. Hopefully you'll experience the love of Christ when you sit around other followers and believers. Yes, hopefully that's the case, but here's the deal. The only way for you to really know and experience and give love is to know Christ. You have to know Him through salvation. In fact, Jesus said, he said this, there is no way, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and there is no way to the Father except through me. And let me, let me change this a little bit, not trying to change anything, but to give some clarity of what I'm saying this morning. He says, there is no other way to the Father. There is no other way to the kingdom except through me. There's no other way through the kingdom. So how, how, do, how do I develop that love? First of all, I have to know Christ. Secondly, John would also give us insight and instructions in John chapter 15. He says to abide in Christ. Abide in Christ. And, and let me, I'll just say it for simplicity, uh, simplicity of this, but it goes much deeper than this. Uh, hang, just hang out with Jesus. Abide. Hang on, hang out, hang with. Abide in Christ. John chapter 15 is an awesome thought process on that know Christ abide in Christ a third thing how do we how do we love how do we understand the, the love of the of the kingdom is we follow his commands John chapter 14 Jesus says 
those that love me keep my commands. And those that do my commands, it shows that they love me. John would, uh, Jesus also in John chapter 13, 15, he says, he says they'll, know, they'll know you're my disciples by the love you have for each other. And so we need to know Christ. We need to abide in Christ. We need to follow his commands. And then I would say the fourth thing, and, and uh, I, I, can I tell you something? Christianity, in, in a sense, is simple and easy, but to live it out is difficult. you agree with that? If you've been saved for more than 22 seconds, you know that. That living for Christ, man, that sounds awesome. Oh, I just need to accept him. Okay, that sounds easy. But then to live it out is sometimes difficult. What, may, what mo- motivates us to live that difficulty out? Love. Love for the Father. Love for God. Love for Christ. But I say the fourth thing, how do we love is, is in Galatians 5.22, it says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Allow the Holy Spirit to work in you. You never see an apple tree shaking in its roots. <laughs> Oh, I got to make apples today. I got to make apples today. Oh. Because in the DNA of that tree is to make apples. Can I tell you something today? You don't have to go, oh, I'm going to love them. Oh, I'm going to love them. No. You allow the DNA of the Holy Spirit to work in you. And love will be like that apple. And boop. Allow the work of the Holy Spirit to develop and mature and increase love. For the fruit of the Spirit is love. You know, a lot of times when you you read ingredients, have you ever read labels and read the ingredients and whatever the first one is, is the greatest of the rest of them that are in there? I don't know if Jesus... Uh, you know, I don't know if when it was written that was, uh, Anyway, but the first ingredient is love. The greatest thing we need is love. And if we'll have love, joy, and peace, and all the other pieces to that, I believe it began to flow out of that as well. But the motivating factor of the kingdom is love. Why is that important to us? Because in the culture of His kingdom... That's what should motivate us. You get up and go to church not because, well, pastor's going to know that I'm not there. I will know that you're not here. <laughs> but not in, not in a mean way. Not like, oh, Deborah, you weren't there. Where were you? Oh, no. I'm going to write Jesus a note. Deborah, no. Because can I tell you something? If I'm her motivating, if I'm the motivating factor in her life, the day that I make her mad, she'll walk out that door. The day that I say something, maybe she didn't quite quite agree with. Maybe I made a decision she didn't like. But you know something? She loves Jesus. She loves Jesus, and that becomes her motivating factor. Then I may say some things, and she'll just go, you know, love covers a multitude of sin, (laughs) even for Pastor Scott. Church, you and I need the culture of the kingdom because his kingdom is everlasting. It'll never pass away. In the end, it's the only one that will remain. And I'm telling you today that he desires this. Here's the result of the kingdom. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the result of the kingdom. And we get to be a part of it because we're motivated for a love for God and a love for others. Father, I pray that in these few moments that you'd hear the cries of our heart and that you would help us. Lord, we thank you that you made a way. As the song was saying, you made a way where there seemed to be no way. As Scripture says, that you'll make a way for us in the desert. Lord, we just thank you right now that When we had no way, you created a way for us. And it's through Christ. 
And we come to you right now and we ask, Lord, that you forgive us and help us and cleanse us and help us to understand what the culture is, your culture, because we recognize in order for us to fully uh, uh, appreciate and fully uh, be able to have all the access to the kingdom, that we must live within the kingdom of that culture. And so, Lord, we thank you today. We thank you today for your love. We give you thanks. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I, I want to close like this, and then I'm going to open up the altars here in just a few moments, and I'm going to have the prayer team come. In fact, if the prayer team would go ahead and prepare to come, because um, we want to, we'll end the service giving you an opportunity to respond, not only to the word, but maybe you have a need today. But this morning, with every head bowed and every eye closed, we want to give opportunity for this, because I, I made this statement early on that God's made a way, and the only way that we can get into His kingdom is through Christ. And so today, I'd like to give you an opportunity to enter that kingdom if you don't know Christ. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, today is the day to say yes to Christ and begin to follow Him. Not because He's ready to, try, he's ready to beat you over the head, not because, uh, but because He loves you. And He desires for you to come. So if you're here this morning, you don't know Christ as your Savior. You've never made Him the boss of your life, and yet you'd recognize that you can't be a part of His kingdom without Christ, and you want to be a part of His kingdom. I'm inviting you to say yes to Jesus. I'm going to just ask you, if you just raise your hand, you can put it right back down. In fact, I'm, I'm going to tell you this. I'm not asking you to join my church this morning, but I am asking you to join this kingdom. Anybody here this morning? Maybe you're here this morning, you know you're not living the way that you're supposed to be living. You need to repent. It's not so much you have to be saved again. You need to repent and ask the Lord to forgive you that He's faithful. Uh, 1 John 1, 9, it says this, If you'll confess your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us or forgive you. And so He'll forgive you today. So today is an opportunity for you to repent. So here in just a moment as we close this service out, we're opening the altars. Maybe you're here today and you need somebody to pray with you because you're sick. Or maybe you need to pray. You need somebody to pray with you in regards to what the Lord was saying something to you this morning through talking about the motivation of the kingdom is love. You, 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 you recognize that your love level is low and you're needing Him to help you. And you just need somebody to pray with you. It's time to respond. Because listen, when, here, here's the thing about that atmosphere. If you respond, if you don't respond correctly, you begin to create a stronghold that's on the other side of res responding correctly. So this morning, we're in this service. The altars are open for whatever need you may have today because we want you to encounter and experience the presence of Jesus. So Sean continues to play and leads. I open the altars. Father, I just, I speak. I speak your peace. I ask Lord that you'd heal, restore. Lord, give us your love. In your precious name, in your precious name.